I'll be talking about modeling of vibratory systems, basics of modeling. Um, as we know, uh, the modeling of vibration requires certain elements. Uh, these are the uh, spring element, which provides elasticity and stores potential energy. The mass element, which stores kinetic energy, or we can call it the inertia element. Uh, then the damper element provides dissipation, energy dissipation for the system. And there are the external forces which provide external energy to our system. Um, we will start with the spring element. Uh, the spring element is basically any uh, deformable uh, body member. For example, a cable or a beam, shaft or a plate can be considered as a spring because it, when, it, when a force is applied to it, it deforms, but then it, when the force is removed, it can come back to its position. All these elements can be modeled by a, a spring, as shown in the figure here, this figure, uh, in which uh, a force applied causes a deformation. If we assume that the spring is linear, the force applied is proportional to the displacement. So a force is applied and there is a displacement and the constant of proportionality is called the spring constant. The potential energy stored in a spring is 1 over 2 kx squared, as you know. Now, let's see some examples of springs. For example, the spring constant of an axial rod in vibration. For example, if you apply a certain force to an axial rod, it will deform an amount of delta. And from strength of materials, we know that uh, the strain is uh, stress over the modulus of elasticity, from which we can find that uh, the deformation is FL over AE. And since the, we, have, we want to find F equals KX, the spring constant is the force over the deformation, so it will be AE over L for a, a rod in axial deformation. For example, if you have a cantilever beam uh, in transverse uh, motion, the deflection of that uh, beam at its tipmost point will be delta. Uh, because of the weight, let's say, at the tip of the beam, if it deforms an amount of delta, again from strength of materials, we can find that the delta is WL cubed over 3EI, from which uh, the force over the displacement gives you the spring constant, and the spring equivalent spring constant for a beam uh, is uh, 3EI EI over L cubed. If you have springs in combination, for example, the parallel springs uh, make a stronger spring, so uh, you add the spring constants uh, if you have parallel springs. If you have serious springs, the springs become weaker, so uh, you add the inverses and invert them. So this is just like in uh, parallel resistances in electricity. Now the inertia element or the mass element uh, obeys the Newton's second law of motion, which says that F equals ma. Or for rotational motions, it says that the uh, moments is equal to inertia times the angular acceleration alpha. Uh, basically, the mass or inertia shows the amount of resistance a body displays to motion. Uh, a body with higher mass uh, displays more uh, inertia, let's say. It starts, it tries not to move when a certain force is applied. Now, uh, the concept of mass is quite straightforward, but when you have uh, combined masses or and inertias, you might need to find the equivalent masses. For example, in this example, we see that uh, a rack and a pinion are combined together, in which they uh, the pinion rotates and it makes the mass move, or vice versa. In which case, we might want to find the equivalent mass of this system. So, to do that, we write the kinetic energy of the system, the translational and the rotational kinetic energy. And there is a kinematic relationship between them. Uh, that is, theta is equal to x dot over r, r being the radius. 
in which case uh, we can find the equivalent mass of this system as uh, m plus j0, j0 being the mass moment of inertia, divided by r squared. Or you can find the equivalent rotational mass with the same technique, and the, the equivalent rotational uh, inertia becomes j0 plus mr squared. The third element is the damping. Uh, in order to model the decay of the vibrations, we decide to introduce a certain amount of uh, energy dissipation to the system. And the easiest way of doing that is adding a damping force of the form. Uh, the damping force is equal to uh, a constant times the velocity. If you do that, you will get a physical solution that uh, decays over the time. This is called viscous damping and it is uh, a commonly used form of damping and also viscous damping is used for example in shock absorbers in cars. Uh, so the viscous damping is basically a fluid damping uh, that has a certain viscosity. It can be uh, applied by in two plates, parallel plates, moving with respect to each other. Or you might have a shock absorber in which there is a piston moving and there are clearances, in which case you can derive, uh, you can derive the force to be uh, proportional to the velocity. Okay. Now we come to the mathematical modeling. Uh, when you want to mod uh, model a vibrating system, there are several options available. You might start from a very simple model, such as uh, this one. Let's say that you want to uh, model a complicated thing like a motorcycle, motorbike, in which there are two wheels, there is a rider, there are uh, tires, there is a strut, and so on. Uh, well, you might just put an equivalent mass, equivalent spring, equivalent damper, and use a single degree of freedom system. Or you might model the uh, rider uh, and the, uh, well, the upper part of the uh, strut, let's say. And then the wheels can be modeled by, by another mass. And the tire elasticities might be modeled by springs. And the strut uh, elasticity might be modeled by another spring, and there are, there are the dampers. Or you might use uh, another more complicated model with two wheels uh, independently and the springs and so on. Or you might even model the rider and the vehicle and the wheels separately. So this is a much more complicated model compared to this one. So the degree of complication uh, de depends on the the complexity you want your for, for the complexity and the accuracy you want from your model. Now a fundamental thing is the degree of freedom. The degree of freedom is the number of coordinates required to de describe a system. For example, if you have a single mass system like this one, you have a one degree of freedom system because the x coordinate describes the motion. The differential equation contains only x here. If you have a torsional uh, rod here uh, with an inertia connected to it, the theta describes the motion. So this is one degree of freedom. On the other hand, if you have two masses, you need x1 and x2. You need two degrees of freedom or two rotational degrees of freedom are required here in the in the case of uh, two inertias and the shaft. Or you, if you have, a let's say, a pendulum and a mass, in that case, again, you need two degrees of freedom. X and theta is required. If you have a triple pendulum, you require three degrees of freedom, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, to describe the motion of the masses. Here you need three degrees of freedom for each mass. The differential equations will contain x1, x2, and x3 here. And also for a beam like this one, every point has a degree of freedom. And it's a continuous system, so it has infinite degrees of freedom. Such a system would be described by partial differential equations. So you might want to model your system by different kinds of methods. 
For example, if you have a washing machine, you might model it by a certain mass at the top and the springs at, and dampers at the bottom, let's say. This might be a model of your system. If you have a car, you might model it by a mass of your car and the wheels and also the shock absorbers. Uh, this becomes a rather complicated model. If you are studying, let's say, vibrations of aircraft wings, you might be uh, introducing many degrees of freedom in the wings and try to find out the vibrations of the uh, airplane with respect to different motions. For example, uh, the aircraft has six degrees of freedom. On top of it, you introduce the vibrational degrees of freedom. Now, in order to obtain the equations of motion, uh, we use three different methods, which are, of course, interrelated. One of them is the Newton's second law, in which you sum up the forces and equate it to accelerations, or for rotational motions, you equate it to I theta double dot. So, combine these equations with kinematic constraints, you obtain the differential equations of motion, the vibration equation, from which you can, uh, solving that vibration equation with the forces and initial conditions, you get the solution. There is the energy method, uh, in which you sum up, write the total energy, and take the derivative of it, uh, and find the uh, with respect to time, since if a conservative system is conservative, then the derivative with respect to time is zero, in which case uh, your system is going to uh, get be zero. And there is the Lagrange equations, which we will see later. Uh, for example, if you have a very simple single degree of freedom system with a mass and spring, uh, if you write the free body diagram, uh, the force acting on this system, there is no external force. Force is minus kx, or in the opposite direction, is equal to mx double dot. So the equation of motion is mx double dot plus kx equals zero. If you have a pendulum uh, that is uh, oscillating, this is again a simple system. Um, let me introduce it here. Uh, the pendulum actually the x something like a spring. You sum up the forces in the tangential direction, in which case you get a nonlinear differential equation it's like this one, uh, theta double dot plus g over l sine theta. The sine theta is a problematic term, and for small angles you can replace sine theta by theta in which theta is, in, is in radians. So you get, again, an equation that is quite similar to uh, the case of um, the case of mass spring system. So the pendulum acts like a mass spring system by itself. Or you might have a torsional system in which uh, the shafts uh, act, the shaft connected to an inertia acts like a uh, torsional spring in which the torsional oscillations of the inertia is the is the vibration, uh, in which case the torsional displacement of the shaft causes uh, oscillations, and there is also the inertia effect of the inertia, as you see. Uh, the details are given here, but the equation is quite similar to what we have in the uh, mass spring system. All three systems I have shown are equivalent. There is also the energy method in which case, uh, the, for example, for a mass spring system, you sum up the uh, masses, uh, kinetic energy and the potential energy, take the derivative, you get the same equation for this uh, your system. Again, for the simple pendulum, you sum up the uh, masses uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy, take the derivative with respect to time, and then uh, you get the same equation, you can linearize it with the same result as you see. Uh, these, the, these examples are a little bit complicated, I'll solve them in the class, 
Okay, these two things are sold them in the club.